Okay, so, you know, the one thing that we've been doing all our lives for the last uh, one and a half years is Zoom, 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 Zoom. So yesterday while I was on a Zoom call and waiting for, for others to join in, I happened to notice that Zoom has um, on their website uh, given a report. Obviously, the report is very progressively positioning uh, uh, positioning Zoom as a leader in this whole thing. But uh, this is a report from Gartner. Uh, and then they said, uh, here's the entire report for you to read. So while I was reading through the report, I found it uh, very interesting because you see, we've been doing SWOT analysis, then we've been doing BCG metrics, and we did uh, things like that for understanding how do we stand vis-a-vis -vis competition and how do we stand uh, with our own internal strengths? So I find this Gartner report very interesting because what they have done is that they've actually used a very similar set of tools for the purpose of doing an analysis of various players in this market. So they have called this the magic quadrant for meeting solutions. Obviously, these are meeting solutions. You know who are all there. Let me go to the quadrant itself. So this is the quadrant that they are talking about. The quadrant has, uh, obviously, the quadrant has not six, not three. It has four, uh, four sections. And um, uh, the, I'm just trying to get your attention to uh, a non-syllabus conversation, but I guess I, I grew up that way doing my part of the learning is that all of this is how you, you learn your management stuff. So this is a very recent report. And then the four quadrants mentioned out here are leaders, visionaries, niche players, and challengers. So obviously, you know this market so well. I mean, you, I, and virtually everybody know this market so well. We know who are the players who are hanging out there on the top. Well, each of us might have our own personal uh, choices. The fact remains is that the leaders, they call it as uh, Microsoft, Cisco, and Zoom are, are leaders. And they are very high on their completion of vision. As you can see, there's this completion of vision uh, thing. I, I hope you guys are able to see my screen, right? Yes, sir. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. good, 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 good. So, so leaders, then challengers. Out there are challengers. Uh, and then you have Google Meet, Log Me In. I never knew there was something called Log Me In. Uh, but challengers are right there, hovering very close to it. And then, of course, there are these niche players. For example, you have Adobe, then you have Huawei. And then you see here, these are visionaries. And they are two kinds of, uh, while, the, while these four quadrants are there, they've also defined them on the, on the axis X and Y as ability to execute and completion of vision. So I thought this was a very, very nice way of putting them all together and to where they are standing. Actually, you guys can download this report. If anybody wants to read this report, read this report from an angle of how do I position various players in a sector? That is the idea. So you, I can, I can also forward that. This is a generally shareable stuff, so I can do that. They then start talking about each one of those players. For example, there was Cisco, there is Google, and then there are. So, but what I also want to emphasize, or maybe have a few minutes of conversation.
Okay, I'm 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 I, I'm back here. Okay, so the the point is uh, they have uh, they have put up the criteria for ability to e execute. So just because see what are the parameters that they have considered on the ability to execute it's about the product overall viability of the product of, of course the weighting out here is for one of them and then the pricing part of it so one is ability to execute and uh, second is the completion of vision the completion of vision is a very in interesting parameter and high on the list is how well do they understand the market and how further down it says how well are they reacting to market situations we say i have this problem with zoom would zoom add this feature or whatever that works so these are all completion of vision so this was a, a very interesting way of positioning there are parameters like innovation geographic strategy and all of this, you guys can read about it. And they also describe who is a leader, who is a challenger, who are niche players. So anyway, this I thought I will uh, share with you guys before we start off, then we, till we have a sizable crowd. So it's 1.32 anyway. Um, good. Mm. So let me, let me stop this. Uh, I, I, this is not what we wanted to do today. But what we wanted to actually do was, what do we have? Global business, branding. Uh, okay, let's, let's get on with this and then start off our class. Do we, um, we have about 36, I don't know, uh, do we wait or do we start off? Deepak will decide. All the best, Deepak. Morning, yeah. there was uh, 60 plus. It shows 38 in my, uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, uh, participants, it says 38. So in the earlier class, you mean there were 60 plus, huh? No, it, yes, it was around 98, 99. We are touching 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a comp, uh, both A and B, I guess, right? Yes, yes. yes. So yeah. there's something I should be worried about now. Wait, guys, little late, Professor. Maybe we can wait for some two, three minutes or five minutes. Three minutes. Okay, so how do we entertain each other in the next two, three minutes? So now tell me. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Seriously, uh, let's have some. Um, let's have some uh, conversation. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me see if I can find something for you guys to uh, have some fun. Mm, we'll we'll start at one forty-five. Uh, one forty-five. Let me see if I can get you guys to have some fun. What's that? Okay. Mm, I'm just trying to find something interesting to Okay, uh, I think I have something. Back to meeting, stop share, screen share. Okay, now tell me who's this? Uh, So, uh, can you, uh, where is it? New share.
do you do you see uh, any uh, any screen uh, no sir why give me yeah. a... it just says that the started sharing the screen now now no, we can see now i can see okay guys this is your uh, quiz name it go for it toyota unilever nestle pepsi bp first one is bp hindustan unilever unix that penguin ट AT&T and uh, C5 it start from W but i'm not sure that's from W and what about C4 Cape Gemini again some of you Cape Gemini please Cape Gemini who is this guy who is that who has got kaka in the madre midnight there in the kanch kotu kondu vandha who is that please mute please beat okay nice okay good now yeah so still at 52 uh, target is 65 now let's go to the next one okay which are which one do you know bsnl mahindra asian paint mahindra asian paint canara bank hrcbc lands everything you know canara bank canara bank Okay. Uh, what about B five? B five. Tanishk. Colors. Tanishk. Colors. 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 Very good. Very good. Oh. And what about B three? Reliance. Reliance. Which Reliance? Anil Ambani. Okay. What? Okay. What about C five? C five. Other. No. No. C five is different. Bajaj. Okay. Oh. Yeah. You guys say you know everything, and you don't know what. Canara Bank. Canara Bank. No. Canara Bank is A six. B four. B four. B four is Canara Bank. You guys want a hint for C five? Yes. 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 Whoever solves C five is exempted from writing the exam. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be in the first place then. Eh? Yeah. So now that's the hint. Whoever oh. solves C five. DSU. Pardon? DSU. Hey, who's that? I want to know his name. Hey, <laughs> that's not DSU. Who's that? Who's that? Okay. Now, um, maybe now last chance. <laughs> Whoever solves C five is exempted from exams. mm exam okay let me make it very clear exempted from mm exam come on yaar you guys have been spending 15 hours with me so far app shutter button to see. sir that's your uh, signature no that aadhar no, no, shutter okay. button search okay what's happening here all kinds of noises anyway that's that's i know nobody would solve this Uh, that's the logo of my company obviously it's not popular but then i put it up put it up just for the sake of fun this is this is what our logo is aniara we spent a lot of money trying to get this nice logo only to notice that um, union bank or something has a very similar logo so sometimes you know you spend a lot of money and you just have a logo which looks like somebody else So was somebody answering that on the chat by any chance? What is C five? Okay, good. Right. So whatever numbers are, I, I guess, are pretty good numbers for today. Let's get on with the class and uh, see where we are. Global business. Okay. And now, can I have everybody mute? Now I'm not starting the class unless and until everybody has mute. because any background noise can be source of hey okay. who's that how do i know who's talking 
Vinay, can you please mute yourself? Oh my. Okay, hopefully this will stay this way for some time. And till, of course, you will selectively unmute and mute yourself going. So lots of, lots of, uh, okay, uh, on and off on the video mode, because I am actually working from a, a, a floor below my Wi-Fi. So I like to be a little bit more accommodative on the bandwidth. But uh, that said, um, um, you, our classes have so far have been so much about me, myself, my company, my product, my solution, my customers. And it's all about how do I enter the market? How do I stay alive in the market? What is my strength? And new words that we learned today, ability to execute vision and you know, vision and mission statements and all that. But then, as a, as a, as a, just as an indicator in our previous class, I told you that the problem is that if I have to expand, unless and until it's a purely virgin market and there's a whole world available for me to go ahead and conquer, which means that there are place for everybody to come and uh, stay, but in most cases, markets are expanded at the cost of competition. Now for me, you are the competition and for you, I am the competition. So, so it could be that all along that mm, company A has to grow, it may be at the cost of company B, or it could be at the cost of the disastrous effect on company B, or many a time company A may want to grow and get boxed out get beaten up very badly and decides not to go there. So as you can see, growth is the oxygen to any organization. It's an oxymoron statement today because the word oxygen has more than one large implication in our lives. Okay. So many a time it's very difficult for us to expand the size of the pie because many markets may get saturated Many markets may not expand in the speed in which I want you to expand, uh, but then eventually it becomes competition. So the idea is that how do I kill my competition to survive in a different field? So now the whole idea is competing under strategic interests. Yeah, I think that is where this is. Yeah, okay. So, Let's look at one, I mean, this is reading for you to look at it. Let's look at one particular slide here. Now pay attention to this is because this means a lot for you to understand why is it that competition reacts differently under different conditions. If you look at this, there are two axes. One axis says, competitors reactiveness now while the other one is attractiveness to you so many a time any any product connector call it britannia call it unilever call it anybody they have a numerous number of products in i'm not necessarily i may take a b2c example but also in a B2B example, we may be working under so many sectors, so many banking, railway, finance, uh, shipping, uh, all kinds of logistics may all be our lines of business as a software company or as any marketing company. While we may have different product lines and different sectors of interest, some sectors are very dear to us. Some sectors are very dear to us. Uh, in an example that I come from, for us, the, we, we serve markets like Telco, we serve markets like uh, uh, Marine, we serve markets like um, long haul communications, we serve news markets, we also serve broadcast market. All of these are markets, but the market that is most 
dear to us, the market which is more attractive to us, the market which is very close to our heart will be something that we will guard very carefully. So that is called the competitor's reactiveness. So if somebody tries to enter a market like or a, or a product in, a, in an area where the competitor is there and that product is E, the competitor is going to react fiercely. The competitor will not allow you to enter that market. But if you look at it, you may not be interested in that market at all. You may be interested in a market like B or a product like B that you want to serve to, to your set of customers. That is highly attractive to you. That's very, very attractive to you. For example, uh, as, as, a, as a point of conversation, uh, the Dian and Sagar uh, University might have, want be largely interested in developing an executive MBA program, which is B. So if, if that program doesn't really affect the, the regular programs run by IIMs, then they say, oh, it's okay. We are, we are not, they are, they are entering a different sector. But if Dian and Sagar also starts entering into a regular MBA program, then uh, the IMs of the world would wake up and say, hey, somebody is entering into a space that is very dear to us. So when you enter a market which is very dear, there is going to be bloodshed. But if you quietly enter a market like B, the competitor's reaction will be low because for the competitor, that may not be a very crucial market, right? So this is one way that we get into a conversation. Now, look at, look at these two examples. Look at these two examples. This is Procter and Gamble versus uh, Unilever. Now, if Unilever were to decide to enter the American personal care products, Unilever is going to... I mean, if Unilever were to enter the American personal care product, Procter & Gamble reactiveness is very high. So they will fight back, they pounce back, they will hit back at this to ensure that their very dear market is not lost. But if Unilever decides to enter the European food market, Procter & Gamble may not strongly react because for them, while they may have some kind of a significance, it may not be a very, very uh, important market and they may be willing to let go that market because that's not going to move their needle in terms of revenue or on market share. So sometimes if you know exactly what your competitor's dearest product is, it is possible for you to enter into newer markets without creating war. Similar example that I'm trying to show to you here is that if Unilever wants to enter into female hygiene products, Procter & Gamble is definitely going to be very, very upset about it and they're going to fight. But if Unilever tries to enter the oral care market, the reactiveness on a PNG is, is reasonably low and they may not fight with you so strongly. So with this basis of understanding, saying that there are two things that happen, what is attractive to you as a market and what is attractive to you as a, as a competitor's reactiveness. If you look at it, as long as the Kias of the world, the uh, who else are there, the Hectors of the world are coming and trying to make some noise on the upper end of the scale in terms of the car market, Maruti is not going to get very upset. But if somebody comes up with a competition to Alto or to Swift, their reactiveness is going to be very strong and they're going to quickly come back and try to fight you up. So I hope you guys have understood this. 
And if you have understood this, we will look at very many ways in which business can happen. Meaning that, where is that slide that I was looking out for? Yeah, meaning that there could be onslaught, contest, gambit, and flank, which are the various ways in which they would fight would happen. Now, first on that list was, what was that? Onslaught. Where is that? Onslaught. Onslaught obviously means that it's like absolute carpet bombing. You will come down, do anything that is possible, do a direct attack on a market, make sure that you, you really fight back and uh, it's a real war for market share. They're repeatedly attacking the market, trying to enter into it. It happens all the time. Pepsi is fighting a battle with Coke. Coke is facing a, a battle with uh, Pepsi. And each of them have their own dear markets. But what really happens in an onslaught, and you have seen that happen in, uh, in India, is that when, when a new player comes in, fire, firing all guns, uh, it, it really is going to affect them so badly that uh, the geo came in and had to have some of them virtually run out of business. They decided that let's go do business elsewhere. But the reactiveness was very high in terms of the fact that Airtel, which was a very primary market for them, and they did anything for them to fight back. So... What happens in an onslaught is that there is absolute war that is going on and that could happen. One of the other examples that we have is that the that IBM was predominantly a DRAM manufacturer. They were doing very well. They had a very good market share and, and, having, and having good success. But the Japanese manufacturers came up with their own DRAMs they, they flooded the market, they cut the prices, and they were totally entering into a market which IBM for a long time held very closely to it. Now, IBM had two options. IBM had two options, was to fight back or to walk out. And IBM, for, for reasons which today are probably the best decision made, it said that I'll walk out of a market which is no longer interesting for me. So that is the way in which they were able to do that. The other instance, I take this and I must quote and unquote that uh, this is an example that I took as a part of an initial activity, but right now it's Wipro winning all the way. While Wipro was doing very well in Indian markets, Wipro decided that it will also enter into the BSFI, which is banking, securities, finance, and something else, market in, in the US. Now, when Wipro entered the US market, a market that was totally dominated by IBM and Accenture, they did not want to lose out. They did not want a new player coming in and trying to do that. So what they did was they started undercoating. They started quoting for opportunities, business and contracts, even below margin to ensure that Wipro doesn't enter this market. Of course, Wipro had to fight quite a bit, but Wipro did hold on, and finally, uh, they did continue to have a significant presence in this market. So in an onslaught, two things could happen. An onslaught, a new guy can come and virtually throw you out, or you might continue to fight and stay. I took one example here of a, of a picture here, which is, uh, I don't know how well you guys can see the screen. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll expand it a little bit more. Uh, on the right corner is about Krishna and Jara Sandha. Or, yeah, Jara Sandha. What happens was uh, after Krishna took over the, the kingdom, uh, he was constantly attacked by this guy called Jarasan for, 
for I think very many number of times. Krishna then realizes uh, that uh, it's, a, it's a battle in futility. There's no way that I can win this battle. So he just moves out. He moves out from, from, uh, from Dwa, from I think, uh, from uh, where was he? Where was the Mathura? From Mathura, he moves out and starts his own kingdom in, in Dwarka or some other place. So he runs away. That's what happens in an onslaught. A, a comp an existing player might just walk out of the business and do away with it. So that's why one of the names for Krishna is uh, Rancho, the guy who ran out of a battle. So this is onslaught. Any questions on onslaught you guys have? I can explain yes, further. Yes, Professor uh, Anil here. Uh, so uh, uh, in the market, uh, definitely uh, computation is a good uh, uh, way. Uh, uh, to uh, grow and uh, provide a better consumer uh, services or yeah. products. But Onslaught, is it good uh, for the consumer? Uh, let me take uh, examples like um, Geo, what, it, uh, what Geo did to the other um, um, service uh, providers. Like uh, at current situation, if you look into the market, um, uh, Google has its own uh, monopoly. Microsoft has its own monopoly. Right. Uh, and then, if you take Flipka, uh, sorry, uh, if you take uh, Facebook, Twitter, they have their own monopoly and they behave what they want. And finally, uh, if you take the other segment like e-commerce, Amazon and Flipkart in India, at least, they are part to each other and having a healthy fight. But whereas in the monopoly, like onslaught. Uh, concept which we talked till now, it is uh, they don't have a tough competition and whatever they do is the you know they they just uh, ruin the market. Absolutely, uh, is that absolutely. a better? Yes, yes. Uh, in the initial times, you will you will benefit you as in the consumer. In the initial times, what is going to happen is that everybody is going to. If you take the example of Geo, everybody is going to reduce the prices. Uh, and uh, they want to they want to stay in the market so so you benefit but eventually eventually what happens is um, uh, when when there is an onslaught eventually there's only one monopolistic player and that's exactly what you are saying now what option do you have other than the google maps you have no option other than google maps there were at some time uh, alternates to google maps but then they come up, they buy you, they kill you, they undercoat you. They, if you are a, if you're a player, they just buy you up. So onslaught is, but then remember, we are taught, we are now not bothered about the competition in this. I mean, we are not bothered about the customer in today's class. In today's class, we are saying war, actually business, War at peace times. That's the title of my, my slide. Is that this is what happens all the time. And it, you might see it happening right in front of your eyes. Guys will come up and open up quite a bit, bit of a thing. The, the contradiction happens in many a case. For example, uh, Starbucks. Starbucks is very well known as a, and, and a premium brand. You know, I mean, I, I'm sure we all would like to go and have, go and have a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And uh, the next question that's asked to you is, okay, Chalo Anil, let's, let's, let's go have some coffee. Uh, where would you want to go? And uh, let's go Starbucks. The next thing that comes to you is, where is the nearest Starbucks? The lack of too much of dominance means that you look for the next Starbucks. Now, Starbucks did something very unique in Australia when they tried to enter into the Australian market. Starbucks started opening up their, their outlets three a day, four a day, 10 a day, that in no time, in no time, there were hundreds of Starbucks outlets in Australia and the wow factor was gone, you know, I mean, there were, you always found a Starbucks next to you, whereas in for a long time you uh, you ask or you you actually look out for where the next Starbucks is. So sometimes onslaught can actually be be counterproductive even to the competition. 
is because if you have virtually entire market, then the market may not grow in the way you want. Uh, you see, there is, it's not always a win-win situation. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I mean, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So let's, uh, uh, let's move to the next one. Uh, the next one being, uh, what is this? Uh, the next one being contest. Contest is another way of doing it. Now, contest would be, it's not onslaught like, like very bad, like carpet bombing, right? I mean, you just virtually go put up everywhere, make yourself present in all the places. But contest is something more narrowed down. You understand the problem, you know what is this, what is the situation that you are right now in, and then try to see how you can get over that. One of the examples that come in, there are quite a few examples, but one of the most commonly quoted examples in, in textbooks is the fight between uh, Warner Brothers and the DVD uh, and the DVD rental industry. So the background is that uh, if, if you are in your early 2000 or even early 90s, uh, I think more 90s, is that what would you do would be that you would never go to a movie to work theater to watch, uh, you, would you would even in, in I remember that you could even hire a DVD player, you would hire a DVD player, then you go to the nearest CD uh, outlet and borrow a CD. So you, you rent a CD um, and um, then you, you come home, you watch it for, a, for uh, you have it for a day or two and return it back to them. And that's it. The whole family of five have watched it for one dollar or two dollar, whatever that is. Okay. I remember uh, we used to. Do, my son used to do that for a very long time. And um, okay, as a, as a side storytelling, and because I have a habit of storytelling, so I noticed that whenever I'm, my son was pretty young there in school and probably in the middle schools, so he would refuse to walk with me on a particular road. So I tell him, why are you not walking with me on this particular? No, no, no. He would be very scared of walking on that. You, I guess we have, you have told this, Professor. I mean, I In remember. the previous one, no? Correct. So, so what happens on the, on the DVD part of the thing is that when, when there is a context, when there's a contest, Warner Brothers is now in a one hell of a problem, is that how do I make people watch the movies? Now, I take a lot of effort, I produce these movies, but you are not, uh, you're not benefiting it. Who is benefiting it from, from it is the DVD rental guy. Now, how does Warner break this problem? What they come up with is that they come up with a, a pure technology solution in which they say that, why would you want to rent a, a DVD for one dollar when you can buy a DVD for two dollars. So now they are they have clearly identified who their competition is, what is it that the competition has got as an advantage, and what is it that I must do now. So now Warner Brothers says buy a, a good print of a DVD for, for two dollars. Why when you want to rent it at one dollar? By doing that, they virtually were able to kill an industry. Of course, Netflix comes in later on, um, and they were able to get along. So a contest is when you fight back, fight back rather successfully using a, a more uh, concentrated efforts towards the solution, okay? So if context is done, the next on our list is Gorilla Campaign. I don't know if I thought I had mentioned Gorilla campaign in my previous conversation. Uh, I, I'll start off if you guys realize that I have mentioned that, stop me so that we have a lot to do. We will try to move forward as well. Okay, Gorilla, as you know, what is Gorilla campaign, right? Gorilla warfare is as long, Gorilla warfare is a warfare where there are no rules. Otherwise there are supposed to be, I don't know what, what rules is that? 
even the warfare has certain rules. Uh, it's named after the country. I don't know what is, can somebody suggest? Or no. or something. Geneva Convention? Geneva Convention, perfect, perfect. Geneva Convention, the way Geneva Convention says, you must treat your, uh, uh, your enemy soldiers well, or blah, 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 blah. But guerrilla campaign doesn't happen like that. Guerrilla is something that happens in the background. If they come there, if the Naxal attack or the terrorist attacks are all uh, unconventional warfare. And unconventional warfare is something that is also found in, in the marketing stuff. Till about a year back, uh, this was the most common example that I would quote because uh, this was probably the only example that you find it in the books. But over the last two, three years, uh, a, the guerrilla campaign of a company called Hayer, uh, H-A-I-E-R, has now become very, very popular. What happens is, if you look at the American white goods industry, meaning uh, washing machines, air conditioners, refrigerators, dishwashers, and things like that, it's a very contested industry, right? Obviously, they are one of the biggest buyers, and uh, there's always uh, room for uh, shelf space. It's very important which brand of washing machine would you see it as you enter a store, because that's going to catch your eye. Uh, and so non-standard players or uh, secondary players in the market are always tucked up somewhere in the background. They do, you hardly get to see it. I, I believe that, let me think of a, of a brand. Uh, I believe uh, Preeti, which is BPL. a big name. BPL. Which was BPL, yeah, good example. BPL may have been there, but I actually, I believe BPL washing machines are the best. But when I want to go and buy a BPL washing machine, it's very unlikely that the salesman would encourage me and nor would the, the model be available. They'll say it's somewhere tucked there in the, in the corner. Nobody wants to talk to you. So it's always about fighting for space. But in such a competing industry, one player came out from nowhere and the Chinese brand, huh? remember it's a Chinese brand. What they did was they attacked the market in such a manner, they attacked the market in such a manner that um, they attacked the ma market in such a manner that uh, the competition didn't even realize their existence. Now, um, which then reminds me, have, have I told you guys uh, the story of the of Chanakya sitting below it, uh, Chanakya watching a mother teach a son how to eat rice? No, professor. Yes no, no. no okay, okay. Yes. Yes. yes, sir. Yeah, you have uh, explained. I have told that. So this is a combined we... class. So I guess maybe there's a. Yeah, but but okay. Which which then if if two stories connected to this, tell me that I have I done this chapter on uh, uh, competition or no? No. Am I? Am I repeating no. this? No, 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 no. Okay, okay. So let's no, forget, no. let's forget Chanakya for a moment to hell with him. Okay. So what what uh, what Hayer did? What Hayer did was that they attacked this market in a slightly different manner. So if if you guys have been to the U.S. and most of the life revolves around highways, and then you have what are called these motels, which are these small. Uh, um, uh, hotels for you to stay. And what Hayer did was that they started having their air conditioners, their refrigerators in the hotels where the customer would check in and uh, spend a day or two. And so you have told this uh, in your previous- I told this, I realized I told this, so because on an offhand remark. So that is the way that they were able to build a, a, a mindset and all of a sudden, people were aware of this particular brand. So that is Gorilla campaign. Fiend is something very different. Fiend is something very different. It is to get you to concentrate elsewhere and target another market. Now, 
uh, I don't know when when I, I just added this lyrics. How many of you understand these two lyrics saying that Kahi pe nigahe, kahi pe nishana, or uh, looking London, talking Tokyo. This is the kind of this thing. So what you do is in a fiend, you divert the attention of your competitor into a totally different market and then attack the market which is of great importance to the competitor. Now, the examples out here is that, for example, Nike is a very well-established US brand. Whereas Adidas is a very well-established European brand. Now, anything that Nike does uh, in Europe is going to be highly contested by Adidas and anything that Adidas does in, um, uh, in the US, Nike would contest it. So what would happen is if Nike plans to enter into the uh, European market, Adidas is going to do not a campaign in Europe, but do a huge campaign in, in the US. So now Nike has two choices. Fight the battle in, uh, in US and save its primary market or continue to pump in money into the, its European fight with Adidas. So this way, what happens is instead of the battle happening where the action is, the battle is actually diverted to another field so that the war is uh, outside of the key markets. So I don't know if you guys have understood this. It happens all the time when uh, if you, uh, they could be, uh, uh, even if you look at Pearl Harbor, if, if, you know, if you know the instance of Pearl Harbor, wherein you, Hawaii was attacked, the Japanese actually send a small set of uh, uh, troops into a certain direction, which makes the Americans focus there, opening up the field in, in, in Hawaii. So similarly, faint is where you get them to fight in another area, Whereas your market of interest is a different. I hope you guys are able to get it. There are some examples here for you to read further. Last one on the list is what is called a gambit. Now, gambit is something that I want you to pay attention to. Is uh, gambit is 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 one of the probably the toughest that happens all the way. The best example of gambit is the fight between Gillette and Bic. Predominantly, if you look at it, Gillette and Bic don't compete today. If you look at it in today's market, Bic is busy with its lighters and pens, whereas Gillette is busy with its own shaving products. Now, that was not the story sometime back. Gillette had also its interest in products that Bic would do, and Bic had its own interest in the, in the men shaving industry. Now, if you look at Gillette, and if, all, if the men obviously would understand this better, is that Gillette makes money not on the razor stick, but on the disposable razors. So they give you the razor at a very razor stick at a very low cost, and they make continuous money out of the number of dis uh, the uh, razor uh, cartridges that you keep on picking up. So they make huge amount of profits in this market. Now Bic was also fighting this battle, but not a, having a leadership position. That was when Big realized that we can do something very unique that we can completely shake up this industry. What is it that Big did was that they said, let's come up with disposable razors. What is disposable razors means? There's a small plastic extrusion. Uh, you, you have a couple of blades in, this, in the edge. You use it for a couple of days and then throw it out. And this would cost 
peanuts, it would just cost a few, few tens of rupees, maybe 20 rupees or 30 rupees. Now, big came in a big way with these disposable razors. And obviously, the market that got hit was the Gillette's very, very guarded razor market, where Gillette had a huge position, had a huge market share, and its revenue was very huge because profitability was very high. Now, Gillette had to fight it because people who were spending uh, 300 rupees, 400 rupees on these cartridges were no longer buying it. They would just buy a 20 rupees or a $1 uh, stick, use it and throw it away. Now, Gillette had to completely fight this battle and they came up with their own disposable razors to compete with BIC. So now, both of them have... Both of them have these disposable razors and nobody's making money because they are cutting into it. That is when Gillette picks up the phone, calls Bic and says, hey guys, listen, both of us are eating into a market which for a very long time was a very profitable market. Let's sit down and discuss. So what they decide was that Gillette will walk out of every other market that BIC has presence, but will retain the, 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 uh, the shaving industry market. BIC will retain everything else, but will walk out of the razor industry market. So this way, a truce is maintained. And the first thing that Gillette does is it stops producing those disposable razors. You notice them, there used to be quite a few of them 10, 15 years back but no longer they are there. So this is what happens in a gambit. In a gambit, the war becomes so severe that both of them lose the thing. And finally, they come to a conclusion and say that I am, you take care of this sector, I take care of this sector. So this is what happens in a gambit. Finally, we have what is called harvesting. Harvesting is something today very easy to explain. Very, very easy to explain thanks to the pandemic. Harvesting is you come up with a technology and then you say, this market is yours, this market is mine. Just like uh, AstraZeneca says, uh, Mr. Serum Institute, you manufacture for these countries. I will manufacture for these countries. There is no competition. We all live in peace. So these are the, these are the five different ways <laughs> Oh my God. Reshma, not done. Okay, so these are these are what the five or six ones are. Uh, it gives you a, a understanding. Any questions on this? We can discuss this further. Uh, needless to say, you'll get a couple of questions on this. All fine? I guess it's all uh, fine. Sir, I have a question. Yes. One slot. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. So the thing is that, uh, for example, like uh, uh, as you gave an example, like uh, Geo took over, took over uh, I mean, uh, with a competition yeah. of uh, the Airtel, Vodafone, Idea, all those things. Uh, so is this a good eco ecosystem that uh, financially strong company uh, came uh, I mean, come up with uh, the competition for uh, small startups and uh, uh, taking over the entire market? It's not, uh, it, it's not healthy, of course. It's not at all healthy. But, but who is there to monitor them? That's why you have called, there is something called CCI in India. That is competitor uh, CCI. I, I Competition I, Commissions I, of India. Pardon? Competition Commissions of India. I mean, Competition Commissions of India, yes. So they come in and they try to ensure that, that uh, something like this doesn't really happen. But, uh, but it happens all the time. Uh, they come up and uh, we, are, we were actually at some point, Zoom was a sector, was a, was a company which was sailing on its own without any problems. 
they it it was addressing a nice good sector i think zoom was only used for classes uh, and things like that and all of a sudden due to the pandemic everybody starts wondering who is the zoom guy he's neither an at&t neither a microsoft neither a google and how is he there and neither is he a cisco and if you notice what happened was that this was onslaught of not one player but onslaught of five six player against one player you see there were allegations of the fact that it was a chinese it was allegation that uh, maybe partly true or partly wrong that saying that it was not very secure so everybody started realizing is that how come i am not in that market when i'm virtually a leader in every other sector google webex webex solutions microsoft with their own skype they did an onslaught but it's probably the smartness of zoom that they were able to withstand these things and get over it so whether it's legally correct whether it has a whole that's that's beside the point the point is this is what happens all the time this is what happens all the time yeah, more like a big fish is a big fish eating small fishes big fish eat small fish all the time big fish eat small fish if uh, i you you will see some new products come out and then somebody else will come up with a product which is a larger thing and then that's why they say uh, when you go to term 3 you will start discussing things like first mover advantage and first mover disadvantage what is the first mover advantage first mover advantage you are the first guy to enter the market uh, you are the first guy to enter the market but the whole market is ready for you but you have to educate the market you have to tell the market how to use the product you have to tell the market this is the way it works if you if you look at the first set of cable operators or the first set of isps or the first set of internet service providers they were all small small guys who were there they educated you they told you how it works they ran coaxial cables they ran in this and then overnight in the the whole industry wake up and consolidates itself and then all these small small players are wiped out it happens all the time it happens all the time okay uh, right sir, yeah, pro professor thank you yeah uh, so uh, i i was just wondering about uh, market uh, like agriculture uh, market for example like oh, like uh, so markets where there is always a need and uh, where people wouldn't prefer uh, other uh, uh, other people taking up the same business kind of thing if if there are farmers everywhere that's a good thing right like and so are there some industries where competition is not uh, take, like they they don't consider competition much as long as they have some, some uh, customers who uh where yeah you see for example farming industry was largely a neglected industry because in india otherwise farming is huge if you if you if you just saw that uh, bill and uh, his wife uh, they just diverse uh, when they got diverse there was a list of their holdings and what kind of thing they jointly hold the largest pieces of farm lands in america so you can imagine the amount of uh, farm land that they must be owning but farming as an industry was very very small and if you look at in india the it's my great grandfather's farm which gets further divided that my grandfather had and my grandfather distributed to his sons and my father distributed to his children and i am having what was probably 50 years back x amount i'm only having one tenth of the share in my farm so how efficiently do i run my farm so i cannot run my farm efficiently because it's expensive to even uh, buy a tractor or expensive to play so effic efficiency in farming takes a hit now how do you bring in efficiency by cooperative behavior by cooperative that is why you know amul is very successful by cooperatively they have singular force amul is able to beat everybody now new farming techniques are all coming in place and uh, 
what they are saying is we will do the thing. There is a company that we closely work with and they say they do what is called precession farming. I don't know where are we heading in this conversation, but let's have the conversation anyway. Precession farming. So they say that for every, every acre of yours, you give me X amount of dollars and I will monitor from the skies how your, agricultural, how your agriculture land is behaving. I will advise you on what to do. So when all this happens, the farmer is just isolated in this business. And who makes the money? It's the bigger player who makes the money. So many a time, on, onslaught in that definition can come from, from anywhere to destroy a market. Okay, right. So anything else on this subject? Somebody else has something. I have a question. Uh, yeah. so uh, like we have so many strategies, like, let's take an example of uh, Tata Motors. Um, so can we adopt more than one technique for one particular vertical or product streams, like for a defense and uh, commercial market? Is, is that possible? I'm so sorry, I, I, I my attention was the answer. Motors? Yeah, uh, what, what I was asking is like, uh, um, is it possible for a company to adopt more than one strategy uh, for different product? Uh, oh, what yes, 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 yes. Depends on where you are. Depends on where this, be. they all, uh, it's not. And again, remember, uh, all planning goes for a toss the moment the first ball is bowled, right? Uh, or, or the, or the, or the, the all or more precisely the language is all planning goes for a toss the moment you get punched on your nose on the on the in the fighting uh, ring so all these plannings are all good in terms of theoretical learning but what happens out there is that um, uh, okay but is that even your even your competitor has the same amount of knowledge and learning right uh, so it's, a, it's going to be Anybody can see what happens in an onslaught. But why would somebody like uh, Geo succeed? Is because he knew from day one what his game plan was and how to get about it. And Gorilla campaign, the example I gave you for hire was you can't try it every time. It can only work once. Uh, it's not going to work all the time. Gambit, we are struggling to give you a second example of Gambit in, 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 uh, in your... Uh, textbooks because this is the best example that we can think of but um, how many times does gambit work in in real life i believe it's not not many times but but you must know what happens as such okay right so done 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 okay so if you're done with this let's move to what's the time now What's the time now? Uh, one twenty-eight. That's uh, one hour. Uh, we'll we'll go to the next on my list, which is Tala uh, Reprint. Okay, let me let me open up another subject that I want to teach. Option recent branding. Okay. Now, branding is something that hopefully you will find it interesting. Where is branding? Give me one minute, huh? I'm, I'll just pick up this. Uh, for some reason, this slide is not appearing. Yes, okay. So branding is something that is very, very important. All of you know, when I ask you for a brand, we name the best brand. I think that was one of the questions that I asked you. Hey guys, uh, can I make a request? Uh, let's take 10 seconds out and check if we are muted or not. Okay, because uh, it, can, it can not only put us, all of us out of uh, 
in our in our conversation i we get defocused and all that so 10 seconds starting now check that you have muted yourself and not perfect thank you very much okay so what's a brand this is the question that i asked you uh, just 10 minutes back and you can tell me everything about it the very look at this thing can tell all kinds of things or okay the very look at this brand will tell you will possibly tempt you to order right i think most likely some of you are going to place some um, amazon orders today just by looking at the logo and honestly very very true very very true and on a on a friday evening if you see a kingfisher logo uh, you know what happens right because these brands and these logos are so very powerful they give you comfort they might give you anxiety they might give you all kinds of things right so a brand is something that's very very carefully developed today we are going to talk about what is a brand how does branding work what are the advantages of a strong brand what is brand equity brand extensions and evaluating brand extensions okay so now this two way that we'll go through this slide is that stick to this particular slide for the next 45 minutes and do nothing else and talk on this slide around so now let me see who is going to answer for me what's a brand what is a brand who would want to take a shot at it what is a brand uh, abbas uh, you were supposed to say hello to me uh, when we were joining in the class right yes i did say hello oh, sir you did say hello to me yeah okay because yeah. i and abbas chatted for a while uh, in on on whatsapp then i then i said say hello okay so abbas what's a brand can you give me some um, what makes a brand a brand or whatever that sentence meant yeah basically a brand is it's a kind of image that uh, comes into a mind of a prospective buyer or maybe a buyer when they are approaching any particular product or a service okay. so like the better we we put in our effort in branding a certain product or services the better it could be for us to you know get something something out of it correct correct okay okay anybody else wants to say something? yes professor uh, yeah. Yeah. Brand is a some... yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. one product. by one anil and then uh, naushad yeah. Okay, Anil. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Brand is something how uh, people perceive uh, you, and uh, in the same way how uh, you uh, give an impression, uh, <clears throat> uh, impression on uh, uh, your um, buyer or customer. Good, or... good. So now, Anil, the counter question to you is: Branding falls where in terms of STP? Branding is where in the S or the T or the P. If you know what is STP, of course. STP standing for segmentation, targeting, so, so where do you think branding falls in? I think it falls in all places. Uh, all the places, okay. Considered, okay. considered in all places before we. Uh, uh, solidify the brand okay 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 yes anybody sir. else uh, naushad wanted to say something at some point uh yes professor like i just wanted to like tell what branding is so i what i meant is like uh i just wanted to give one small instance like i mean not exactly instance like previously during like maybe say during uh, medieval times like during oh, when kings used to rule i mean maybe in series you would have seen like if someone does something we would brand them i mean the kings used to brand them with some so it shows that that person has done this mistake or done this crime. Absolutely. Absolutely. Criminal. So it's kind of a unique identifier mark. So correct, correct. just with that brand, people would know like what kind of a product or what kind of a person that person is. So it's similar with the product also, like what kind of a product it is. Correct. Correct. So once you get branded, you're gone. No, that's it. No? Yeah. Once you get branded, it's very difficult. Like I always say, 
like I always say, and I, I love that character. I mean, as a matter of fact, last week I was watching Jolly LLB myself, but I, he's branded, he's poor guy, he's branded as, uh, uh, what is his name? Sarkin. So how much ever hmm. you try, it, it's gonna, you, you, you see comedians playing or uh, uh, villains playing uh, hero roles or vamps playing heroine roles. <laughs> Very tough, very tough because they get branded and uh, it, it gets very difficult to get out of the thing. So now, anyway, what is a brand? Look at these kind, these kind of uh, brands. HMP versus Rolex. And uh, Bata, actually, I didn't know that Song Yong, when I wrote this particular slide, uh, I didn't know much about it. I was, uh, but I do realize that's a big brand too. Uh, Professor? Uh, I yeah. just had a doubt, like, uh, yeah. is reputation of the company called, like, maybe it is a brand of the company? We'll see that. We'll see that. We'll see that in the next five minutes. What what goes, what are the uh, ingredients of a good brand? So what happens yeah. when you say HMT versus Rolex? Uh, there are two things that happen to you. One is, if I, what would, what would, what would you conclude if I were to wear a HMT watch? And what would you conclude if I were to wear a Rolex watch? I mean, I don't want you to tell me what you're concluding, but then you are making a mental image of myself by the very fact that uh, Ramesh is having a, a HMT watch. But today, if I'm having an HMT watch, I'm, I'm sure you guys are going to like it because that they're no longer being manufactured and you might come and ask me from where did you get it? So, uh, so, so brands are there. Each one of them, even HMT is a painfully built up brand. Maruti Suzuki as a brand, you know, um, there's no way that uh, that brand would get diluted. Even though Suzuki is now owning more than 51% of the company, they're not going to change the name of the company to Suzuki Maruti because my tongue won't twist and turn with that same ease as Maruti Suzuki. So that's a painfully built up brand. Uh, I don't know if you guys recall that uh, Ola picked up Taxi for Sure and they ran the Taxi for Sure uh, for, a, for, a, for a period of time and before they merged the name. Flipkart picked up Mintra and they continue to run it under the Mintra because Flipkart is, according to you and me or the general public, is, uh, is not a great brand uh, uh, or compared to Amazon. But Mintra is a, is a great brand when it comes to shopping. So each of them want to retain a painfully built up brand. And this is, of course, uh, uh, a B versus A K uh, could could be anybody. I, I meant um, Amir Khan versus Amitabh Bachchan, but it could be. It was also an A K versus A K as a movie. But then that's beside the point of conversation. So a definition of a brand. This is what the brand definition is. Okay, you see, you see what happens when you look at it. It's a combination of multiple things that happen and give an identity to the setup. Now. What are the, uh, each one of them, you know, each one of these are, the moment you look at the McDonald's brand, lots of things that go, up, go on in your mind. And um, you might even order a burger now. So a brand does a lot of good things. Now, one of the roles of a brand is that it gives you the identity of the manufacturer or the maker, or the owner, or the person who's, who's, or the entity, or the organization. The moment you say, there are two huge brands here, Tanish, a Tata product. The brand Tata is enough for Tanish to get a certain mileage over a competing brand. That's it. So Tanish was a, was a, they, Today, you might, they might come up with another product and say Tanish, which is uh, 
uh, X, which is the Tanish uh, uh, sister company or something. But the brand Tata is the one which gives the edge, the advantage, the comfort feeling. And these are not things which came up overnight. So it doesn't really matter what computer I buy, as long as the very fact that it says is that it's Intel inside. It's the Intel which is helping me to sell my computer. So that's what the brand does. That's what the brand does. And these two symbols are universal in India. They mean a lot. You may want to look for a red or you may want to look for a green symbol. Now, how many of you know what is this symbol? So this is Telstra, I it think. Uh, Google Pay. Google Pay. Google Pay. Hold. No. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, so what is this? This is Tez. Yeah, Tez. What, what was Tez doing? Uh, like, it was just changed to Google Pay. It was exactly the same. Online wallets. UPI okay, so payment. Why, and... why, why, did, why did it change to Google Pay? Question number one. Question number two is, why didn't Google start up with Google Pay? Uh, professor. So first of all, because of the credibility that Google is having in the market, the brand image that Google is having. So I believe that was one of the reasons why they have changed the name from Taze to Google Pay. Okay, my question is, why didn't they start with Google Pay? They were not sure where the market would go, where this UPI payment, where the digital payment would go. So they didn't want to uh, spoil their image, spoil the brand. Saying that spoil something, the brand, Naushad, complete the sentence. They didn't want to spoil the brand. Uh, when if if the product would, I mean, if the product doesn't work out, I mean, if the industry doesn't work out. Absolutely brilliant, good, good thought. Anybody else? Very nice because Google. But then then you say it's a Google product which failed. Right yes. now it stays. Yes. It worked. It's worked. It's very simple. I just I, I take ownership of the success. But yeah. Taze was also and a beta version which was released only in India. So before releasing it to worldwide, uh, it was named as Taze. Yeah. So because Google was not very sure about, and they didn't want to get a bad name, they already had Google Glasses and they Google anyway. Uh, they play around with a lot on the brand also, but. Uh, they also have other names and then finally they merge it to their stuff as such. Okay. So, so this is, and it was uh, actually launched right around demonetization time, uh, in 2017, I guess. And yes. uh, demonetization happened in 16. So it was kind of like an experiment instead here. Correct, correct. But they may have an experiment, but they didn't want to experiment with the with their Google brand. That's the point that we were trying to talk and state. Excellent. Next we have the role of a brand. With what does the brand, what was the earlier one? What, what it identifies the maker. Now what it does, it creates a barrier to entry and it signifies quality. Well, I don't know how many of you know what is a priority pass. A, a priority pass is a, is a unique card or a membership which allows me to use the lounge in, in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. So if I have a priority pass card, I can then go and use the lounge. And not everybody can get a priority pass. I can only, I have priority pass because I bill, I don't know, I bill five lakhs on my credit card or I bill 10 lakhs on my credit card. And hence, I get what is called a priority pass. So, so I, I will definitely want to flaunt it. So next time I want to meet you guys at the airport, I say, hey guys, are we flying on the same flight, Naushad? Then let's, let's meet at the lounge uh, and then I'll flash my priority pass and make you, make you jealous about it. Because that becomes a barrier for entry. You have to qualify to do that. Similar to priority pass, you have what is called the Emirates Skywards, or you have any, everybody else, Jet Airways, Miles, and things like that. Why do they do that? Is that 
only if you do a certain amount of miles that you qualify for it for the good things that come along with it right and you see this all the time uh, these kind of a barrier to entry not everybody gets an access to it uh, the the brand itself becomes a pass or an or a tool for you to enter the second is um, you cannot see this very well here, uh, but I'll tell you the background why this particular slide is here. I don't know, there is something called sort text here. Now, I, you know what happens is that um, all these uh, uh, India Gate, Kohinoor, rice, each of these rice are supposed to be every grain of rice is photographed and a very very unique system is very is photographed and checked for quality before it's packed and that's what they say virtually every grain of rice is is inspected in an automated system called the sortex now there is this company uh, and there was this uh, couple of students from that company who were there in our previous batch. And so I, I like that up and put it up here. So they say that next time when you're buying rice, look whether they have sort text on, their, on, the, on the bag of rice or on the packet of rice, because that shows that it has gone through a highly qualified uh, quality check process. So, that the very word sortex shows that it is it is qualified or it has a significance of quality so that's one other example of what is happening in terms of the uh, signify a quality thing then you have obviously there is no discussions on this then you have what is called provides a competitive advantage right the brand Evion versus the brand Bisleri. <clears throat> both are water per se, both are indeed water, but the very fact that I, you walk to my house and I offer you Evion water, it would, it would give a huge competitive advantage over anybody else. And because it's Evion, it is possible for them to charge a premium on the water that they sell. So eventually, right now, one of the benefits of a brand is that you can, you can uh, charge a premium for the service. And you've seen this happen all the one. Now everybody is busy buying masks and oxio, oximeters and uh, temp, uh, what is this, thermometers. So you walk into a store and they say, uh, so this is a, a Chinese brand or they say that this is, a, this is a very famous branded one and now you may have to pay 30% more premium. So there you go, you, you're paying for a premium and we're paying happily too because that brand can attract a higher price. So one of the advantages of the brand is that you can, and you notice that the, there is nothing different between the OnePlus and any other Android phone because they are all Android anyway, uh, but it's the, it's the premium price that you can possibly demand because it's a OnePlus phone. So that is one additional thing that a brand can do. The second thing that brand gives you is that it gives you a sense of comfort. It gives you a promise of value. It gives you a promise of consistency of delivery. You can be sure that any Apple product would work brilliantly. So far, none of them have actually been a uh, you know, letdown in that sense. So the very word that it's an Apple product means that, uh, oh, you know, it will work. Nothing can go wrong with that product. And it's easy to use and lots of other adjectives that get connected to a particular brand. Then uh, similar to Tesla, you know, there's so much stories about 
how the Tesla works and how the Tesla auto mode has saved people's lives. And that's, and then you're willing to pay that extra dollar for that thing. And uh, that's one other thing that a brand can do. I don't know why this slide keeps going back to that. There is something called brand equity. What is brand? Oh my God, I lost the... Yeah, brand equity. What is brand equity? The brand itself has a value. The brand itself has a value. Now, <clears throat> Kingfisher as, as, uh, as an airline or Kingfisher as, uh, as a beverage company, they believe that the, the very brand Kingfisher can attract a certain amount of brand equity to it. And if you look at this list of companies out here, each one of them, of course, right now, they are all Kishore B and its company in, in bad trouble. Uh, so you have a uh, hometown, big bazaar, each of them was a brand by them itself. And the differentiation between each of them was very thin. Obviously, the other example that I'm trying to quote is the very fact that you are a product of the Diane and Saga University. That's another painfully built up brand. And hence, there could be an equity associated with it, which means that a company can claim a certain amount of money for the use of that brand. Any questions so far? None whatsoever, great. So finally, what can a brand do to you? The very fact that there is, a, there is this brand, there are certain things that happen to you. For example, the moment I say Amul, there are certain feelings that go in your mind and the, the word Disneyland can talk about all kinds of things or of a, of a fun affair that you might want to have with your family and kids, or the word, it's an, oh, you're flying Indigo, or oh, most likely that you're going to reach in time. So these are some kind of a belief processes that brands do to you. And of course, uh, my, my feeling is uh, uh, NDTV 24 bar seven, I mean, that's a news that you can possibly trust. So this is another thing that happens on the branding part of it. Finally, uh, we have what is called uh, uh, brand equity, that these are uh, very complicated methods. We'll not spend too much of time on this, but that by itself is the conversation which talks about how interbrand defines how should, much should a brand be prized at? So that's, that's one conversation, but we'll not spend too much of time on that. Finally, uh, I think these are all the attributes of a big brand, good job. Then we come to what is called brand and line extensions. And I really want you to pay a little bit of an attention to this. What are called brand and line extensions. That means that if you have a, brand, how do you want to take mileage out of it? And if you have a brand, how do you diversify the mileage process towards taking it? There are two examples out here that I will talk about. One is called brand extension. When the brand extension happens, you will use to launch a totally new product you will use it to launch a totally new product which includes the name uh, Dove or includes the name Unilever or so. So you could have Dove come up with soaps and also it might come up with some kind of a, a perfume or other things. So that is called a brand extension. A line extension is people love Coke so you come out with different varieties of flavors on the Coke, that is by extending the line using the brand. So these are two different examples. Uh, I hope you guys are following me. 
if you are not understood brand and extension and line extension, let's stick to it. You might get a question or two on this. So this is what we have in terms of brand extension and line extension. Brand extension is using the brand. For, a, for example, uh, Jaguar is a very popular and famous uh, 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 sanitary fittings company. Uh, they, they are probably the top on the list uh, company when it comes to those products. And um, what they now do is they have what is called Jaguar electrical fittings because of the fact that that's another product that goes inside the house and they have built a huge superior feel uh, among the customer base that they believe that they can do the line, uh, the brand extension into a new thing. Of course, brand extensions can be sometimes very, very dangerous because um, uh, sometimes you, you get branded for it. For example, if, if, if the word Harpic is something that is very commonly used in, uh, in bathrooms, and the only other product that is obviously present in the bathroom is the toothpaste, you can't think of having Harpic toothpaste because that could have a disastrous effect when it comes to brand extension. Line extension is that when, once you have built up some kind of a, a brand by yourself, you further expand on it. That's, that's when you have a series of other services like you have FedEx uh, Flight, FedEx Ground. You have FedEx as a brand. You use that for every other size in terms of the courier service. With that, we are done with brand extensions as well at, at three o'clock. Um, we can take a 15 minutes break or if you have questions on, on branding, we can do a little bit of uh, branding and then we can uh, take the break. Any questions? Or have you all fallen asleep? No, Professor. No, so the one who said so just woke up? No, no, I'm just pulling your leg. Okay, okay, <laughs> good. So uh, so we are done with this. Uh, do we take a 15 minutes break? Is that a good idea? Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. Okay, so at, at three o'clock on, uh, on my watch, uh, 3.15, uh, you guys have a cup of coffee or, or whatever, and then we will assemble and do what? We will assemble and do with one particular subject, which is called Porter's Five Forces. And maybe we will uh, uh, talk a little bit on market research, not too much in depth. We'll talk about market research and then we are done. Okay, so 3.15, I'll, I'll see you all. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Pause recording. Recording. So, who are you presenting to? Why would they be in interested in your presentation? What benefit would you be providing? And what should be in the presentation? There are lots of things that goes in. There is supposed to be a miss mission and vision statement. There's supposed to be an elevator pitch. And I'm sure some of you know what's an elevator pitch. What's an elevator pitch for somebody who knows it? Uh, basically, you have to present uh, what's your business about uh, to a guy in a minute or so. So it came originally from a situation where a, in, where, in which like uh, a guy has to tell about his business to another guy uh, in an elevator before he gets out. Perfect, perfect. Excellent. So you, you, must, you need to build up your own elevator pitch and then you must have a more serious document, which would be an executive summary. And then, of course, you will have some PowerPoint slides which talk about what, what the business does. And then you have 20, 30 pages of the full gamut of things which goes out there. So these are top typically 40, 50, 60 pages of stuff that you would do it. That's good. That's one way for you to look at it. But before you get there, before you, and a lot of you are saying, What's the flow? What is the problem am I visualizing? 
what do I see that the world facing a problem? And what is that solution that I believe I will be able to offer? And how do you think my problem or my solution is going to be taken up by the user who is facing the problem? Am I truly going to make that difference? But if, is this just purely a problem on paper? Can I really implement it and scale it up to, an, to a level that I can make it an operating thing? Who do you think will eventually benefit from it? What technology would I need to be able to do that? The problem may be something as minute as uh, um, uh, a, a problem that exists today. But do I have the ability to look at this problem and look at whether the problem, I would, I would be able to address it over a long period of time? What is all that happens? These are the questions that come into anybody's mind when somebody does what's called a business planning. One of the very commonly thought about methodologies is called uh, the, uh, the 5W1H model. The 5W1H model is a very commonly, you take a you paper napkin when you're sitting with your friend and you want to build up a business plan, this is what goes on in your mind. Very, very rudimentary method of doing things. A very, very rudimentary. What does it say? I have an idea. Yeah. So who is going to benefit from this idea? Then you have a lot of sub-questions which come up to that. I have an idea. Where do you think the opportunity for my idea exists? What is it that my idea does? Why would anybody want to, want to subscribe to this idea? So these are some very basic questions. Then how do I go ahead and do it? How do I reach out to a user? How do I reach out to a financer? These are all very simple, rudimentary ways of looking at it. But as you progress in your managerial thought process, you might want to use something very more systematic. A more systematic methodology that's been considered is what is called the samples. Here we talk and define them not in a, in a very open manner of the five WH, very, very open. Here you get into more serious working out. You say, who do you think are my suppliers? What kind of an employee branding that do I want to have? Where do I source my hardware, my thing? What is the process that I'm going to do? And how does this process make the whole thing possible? What kind of a distribution channel do I want? So if it is possible for you to answer each one of these questions, then you may possibly realize that, yeah, maybe it's a great idea or no, it's not a great idea. I think we are going to get stuck in somewhere along this process. I might want to go and retweak this process. So this is one of those very commonly used methodology, which is called the same courses. These are, will be available in your slides. The other model is to look at it whole thing from what is, you know, the red ocean, you know, the blue ocean, all of that we have talked about it. You look at it from a cost perspective and you look at it from a revenue perspective. So what are the various costs that are involved? How do I look at them from a cost point? And then what are the things that I would do to improvise on my revenue? Who are my customers? What segment do I do? How do I get to them? What kind of a retail or a distribution model do I have? And then of course, what's the final output going to be and how unique is that output going to be from a customer point of view. There's something a little more uh, complicated, which is called the cost and effect modeling. Uh, sorry, cause and effect modeling. Meaning, uh, somebody said something? No, okay. Meaning is that 
when I do this, what happens? When I do that, what happens? And how will it eventually be? One of the best ways to explain this to you is to look at the Indigo model or the even more famous Ryan Air model, wherein Ryan Air said that I will do these following things. What is this I'm going to be? I am going to be known for low cost flights. My, my whole model is based on low fares. This is it, low fares. The principal mode of my operation is low fares. So when I become low fare, I become famous because my fare is low. Now, when my fare is low, I obviously can afford to pay low commissions to my travel agents. When my low fare is, my, my fare is low, there is already a built-in expectation that low quality of service is going to be expected. And hence, I'm not going to be giving any meals because that is not going to be included in a cost and they're not going to be upset about it because they know that nothing is really free in this world. So because it is low cost, I might end up inviting young leisure travelers. And I, because it is low cost, I'm not differentiating between business and economy class. And hence, I will have a fixed cost for all my expenses. How do I get to a fixed cost? Because everybody knows that I am a low fare. I'm going to be a tough negotiator and I'm going to standardize my fleet of airlines. I'm not going to go Airbus plus Boeing plus Bombardier. No, I'm going to stick to one airline. And hence, because I'm sticking to one airline, it is possible that I can work out in uh, rolling out my pilots and my crew. And because I'm a low cost airline, my profits are going to be less. My office is going to be not very uh, huge, uh, hugely decorative. And hence I look at high powered incentives for my people, everything goes on. So, so the point is once you get such a thing, you start playing around with it to look at how do I do a cost and effect modeling. So you could use one of these things when you go into your other thing. But off late, over the last couple of years, one particular business model has become very, very, very popular. This guy is, is a young guy who is... Uh, uh, who's recently got awarded uh, under the Thinkers 50 as one of the greatest thinkers. So here it is a business model that you will use in the form of what is called a business model canvas. So Alex was the one who was recently uh, started his company called Strategizer and even has a, has a model called the business model canvas. He uses nine blocks to come out with a model to do your business model, whether it's going to work, whether it's not going to work, what are the challenges that are going to be, and how do I get about it? So we will look at the various models that he takes about. First thing he wants to know is, who is my customer segment? Who am I going to be servicing? If that customer is the one who's got to be serviced, what is the value proposition I'm giving him? <clears throat> Give me a minute. Huh? What is it that I'm going to tell that customer that here is the value do I bring it? So why would the customer be excited? That's because of the value that I bring. If that's the value, how do I deliver that value to my customer? And finally, how do I stay connected with my customer through the entire process of the conversation? So these are the first four of the building blocks that he talked about. Then he came up with the rest five of the building blocks in which he said, 
I need to know what is my cost structure. What are the things that I will be spending on? And who are my key partners for this success? If I were to build an internet company or then my key partner has to be my internet service provider. So unless and until I have some great relationship with them, unless and until I have some great understanding with them because he's a key fellow who is going to do it. The second is what are the key activities that I will be performing? What are the key activities that goes into it? What are the key resources that I'm going to get? And where are all the various revenue streams that are going to come from? So these are the nine building blocks that he initially made. He added two more of them. Uh, I think uh, just a minute. Huh? Uh, he added two more of them and he called them because of the world that environment and the social impact became very important. He, he added the social and the environmental cost and social and the environmental benefits. So this is how the key business model canvas looks like. What is the value proposition that I'm giving? Who are my customers? Let's look at one particular model and try to understand it. Uh, I think I'll take a better one. Uber. Uber is, is one example that is very popularly used here. So what? who are your key customers? For Uber, the key customers are the passengers and the drivers because both of them are using your platform. What is the value proposition that you are giving to your customer? If it's my passenger customer, I'm telling him that you get taxi on demand. If it's my passenger, I'm telling him that you get cash-free payment. You have to order a cab and wait for the shortest period of time. If it is the driver who is my other customer, I'm going to tell him that you're going to get passenger on demand. And it is possible for you to make money whenever you want. You can, you can shut off your service, switch on your service whenever you want. So what kind of a relationship are you having with him? You, in this case, it's a very highly automated relationship that you maintain with your customer. What are the channels of communications that you have? You have a mobile app and then all kinds of activity that happen. What are the key activities that happen here? One is that you need to maintain a balance of supply and demand. You want to make sure that there are not too many cars floating around, nor are there too many customers waiting. The second thing, of course, you are adding customers, but you also need to be adding drivers on board. Then who are your key partners? The drivers who own cars, you need to have a payment gateway. If that payment gateway is not reliable, then you have payment issues. You need to have a reliable mapping solution, which ensures that the best effective routing of your car services. And lastly, of course, the local authorities should give you permission. You must have some good relationship with the, with the local municipality, the, the, uh, the police and everything else. Then where, what are your costs? Where does your cost go in? It goes in sales and marketing, in developing the platform, a lot of salaries to be paid, and of course your drivers have to be paid. And where does your revenue come from? So these are what it is. So this is one typical model. There's one for, for Google. Uh, you can look at it later. I thought I wanted to share this with you all because uh, uh, not, not relevant from an examination point of view, but not all of us are out here to study for exams. It will eventually, it's, it's betterment of our own lives. So there you are. If you have any questions on this, let's briefly talk, talk about it or we'll move forward. No? Good. Okay. So next we will open another one, which is the final point of conversation, which is Porter's Five Forces, new share, Porter's Five Forces.
Porter's five forces, again, uh, the beauty of marketing is that all of these guys are new way of thinking. Mr. Porter, Michael Porter is very much hale and healthy. He's doing fine. So these are all new, new thoughts of looking at how business reacts. Now for any kind of a business activity, there are, we looked at, we looked at competition, right? We looked at what could kill us. We looked at what could kill us. A competitor could kill us. Inside the competitor, we broke it down further into onslaught. How do we fight with faint, gambit, and all that stuff. But now we look at the whole industry in a larger framework of things and see how it looks at. What could kill you or what could hold on to your existence? Michael Porter came up with an analysis of what happens within an industry and how an industry behaves. Let's look at these examples. Uh, we take this. Yeah, we'll go and stick on to this particular slide for the rest of our conversation. Is that one, two, three, four, five things can happen to your business. One is the threat of new entrants that we discussed quite a bit here. We said a new player could come, he could dislodge you, a new player could come and take away your, your customers and then you are left without a substantial market share. So that's one kind of a problem that you will come up with. That is the threat of new entrants. That happens all the time. Second is you have what is called the bargaining power of the suppliers. What does the bargaining power of suppliers mean is that your supplier might actually hold you at ransom. Meaning that if your supplier is, you're in airline industry, all, you may not have the fear of new entrants. You may have a large market share. You may have the, the most loyal of the customers, but what if you do not have access to fuel? What if your primary supplier holds back for some reason? And it happens all the time. Uh, we have we had another slide on that. Is that here? Let's see if I have that slide here. No, I don't think I have that slide here. But uh, what happens is that your your supplier could could damage your own progress if if you don't get. And that's what probably is happening if you look at at some point on the manufacturing of the COVID shield is that some of the prime supplies have to come from US and now India is out there begging them to ensure that you don't hold back the supplies. So that could ruin an industry if you have a bad relationship with the supplier. The third, of course, is what is called the threat of substitutes. What's threat of substitutes is that one fine day your technology can get outdated. You no longer are having the best of the technologies. It happens all the time. If you are not watchful, somebody might come up and throw you out. Uh, there was a period of time when we would have to uh, beg with the auto drivers and say that, uh, uh, please come to this place. And he would ask for 1.5 times the fare. But overnight, we have this concept of uh, Ola and Uber booking up autos, or there is an, a new substitute in terms of reliable taxis, and you're, you're out of business. So that is one other thing that happens, which is called the threat of substitutes. Now we have what is called the bargaining power of customer. Where do you think a bargaining power of a customer could impact your business? What can one of you think about it? Why the bargaining power of a customer could also be? Pardon? Real estate business. Example? Uh, 
if say if you are, if you are having a, uh, if you are a popular builder mm. like uh, prestige or brigade and that two both of them are located in the same location and then like same type of amenities are there same uh, household structure or like similar things but uh, one person is quoting uh, high and the other person is quoting uh, a little less saying like quality of our buildings or like their infrastructure is different or each and every house will be getting proper sunlight things like that and customer will actually try to compare and they will have the power to choose okay okay yeah that's that's uh, that's good that's in that's nice uh, that's uh, uh, quite very close to what uh, i was thinking of good job yes sir uh, uh, anybody I else yeah professor uh, in airline industries itself since uh, the market is quite saturated uh, the uh, airlines what they do is like they'll come up with uh, quoting a little low price so that is when like the other airlines also start uh, getting the pressure of this bargain from customers because they will uh, see that the other airlines is giving a lot less price for the same ticket to the same destination so uh, they'll start bargaining with the other airlines as well mm, okay okay and anybody else uh, professor abhinav here yeah. so if i am a customer and if i have to buy some product then i i'll try to find five six different places from where i can buy and i'll do a price match where i i'll find like uh, a good price i am getting like in uh, less price i'll buy from that place okay 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 good uh, and there are some companies uh, there are some more companies like some of them will have yeah 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 can i can i interrupt you um, yeah sure uh, i want you guys to look at bargaining power of customers from the b2b model sir i'll just share uh, an example from the manufacturing industry yes let's, let's say uh, there are many big companies like let's say hindustan motors is a, is a big company but then they are not a finished product by themselves they have to take raw materials uh, let's say steel of different grades with different coats from different people and then eventually it will go to subcontractors for some processing and then come for assembly to hindustan motors now what happens right. when these people supply let's say steel of different coats and different uh, strengths these people bargain with hindustan motors telling that you know what i am the supplier for three other companies and i'm going to give you at this rate only now hindustan motors would have put in some amount of profit margin over this and then they're going to lose that margin in the bargain so, so that is the bargaining power of the suppliers right yes yeah that's a brilliant example of bargaining power with the suppliers because uh, yeah and uh, we'll, i'll see if i can get pick up that slide also in few course to explain how bargaining power with the suppliers but then um, yeah anything on the bargaining power of the customer yeah professor uh, i just would like to add one point here as anand said uh, currently we are uh, mm, ended up in a bargaining uh, strategy like uh, uh, we are supplying a product to one of the company where the tend uh, order will be comes from the tendering we are supplying to a government company uh, there the, we, are, we have a three competitors the competition is like that whoever quotes less they will get the order uh, because Correct. of our competition we are reducing the cost uh, year on year now we are pressurizing our suppliers to give us a discounted price of raw materials and the products uh, otherwise we cannot be in this market line so that's how we are bargaining with the supplier side correct and as a matter of fact you 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 use this to explain both is that your your customer is also bargaining with you hugely your customer is bargaining with you hugely for for example one of the one of the one of the conversations that come up is uh, uh, there was a period of time uh, when the e-commerce boom had just started the e-commerce boom uh, any one of you know who was one of the pioneer e-commerce uh, websites in india 
I mean to say before Stab the deal. birth of uh, Flipkart. Snap deal. Before the birth of Flipkart and Snap deal. eBay. eBay was more like uh, yeah, it was there. eBay dot in was there for some time, uh, but uh, yeah, even before that maybe. Natra, Amazon Flipkart is a good. Uh, no, no. Before Baba. No, there used to be a company called Rediff. Rediff dot com. Yeah, Rediff dot com. Okay, so there used to be a company called Rediff dot com. He was one of the pioneers in in that the e-commerce. That was a very 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 different world yes. at that time. So they used to always talk about how much he sold on his on his on his e-commerce website. Of course, it had. it had no resemblance to what we are doing today but why am i getting out there is that he would always most of the e-commerce discussions webinars uh, seminars would always talk about a woman in surat now this is a very interesting thing saying that there was this woman uh, gujarati hard working entrepreneur woman who would do uh, fine uh, artwork on sarees fine artwork on sarees and she would go to virtually every custom every uh, shop and beg them to sell her her uh, the those designer or very basic designer sarees or whatever you want to call it now this guy would uh, the shopkeeper would of course pick it up and say uh, i'll pay you after 120 days after the sale or my sale margin is going to be 30% and so if you sell it for 1000 rupees i'm only going to give you 700 and even that 700 i'm i'm only going to give you after 60 days so what happens is when you are set up in a situation where you are dead walled by your customers you have nothing to do but to look at the bargaining power of the customer and your stock now this lady had to virtually go from street to street begging for her sarees to be uh, showcased and then eventually the snap deal guys came to know about this and they had her advertise her sarees on uh, uh, on snap deal and overnight she became a sensation overnight she became a sensation she turned out from being nobody to somebody like a uh, 80 100 crore entity and became very famous and they say one of the reasons for her success is that we were able to really do a e-commerce benefit to her so the bargaining power of the customer eventually today the likes of that lady and others they have no other option but to sell their products on amazon till 4 5 years the bargaining power of the customer was the was the sari shop guy on the on the streets of surat who would dictate what he would buy the products for now amazon and flipkart are doing the same they are now saying that you have no other option but to agree to my purchasing power capabilities and why i demand you will do it so they might say that you will have to pay for transport you will have to pay for courier and then we take something like 30 40% so this is one extreme example of saying that the customer also has a large bargaining power if you at the other example that anant and hemant were trying to give you is that if the customer is a government of india you are just bound by the bargaining power of that customer because he dictates the the process of the sale he dictates the process on which the payments uh, milestones would be done so you guys agreeing with me on the bargaining power of the customers are you am i convincing enough to explain this 
Make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. yes. okay. Good. So if you've understood threats of new entrants, if you understood bargaining power of the suppliers, if you understood threat of substitutes and bargaining power of the consumers, there is the worst of all, which is competitive rivalry within the industry. Now, this is another viewpoint. Imagine a, 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 a sector, imagine a sector where occupancy is 90%. All flights are full. All sectors are busily occupied and the industry is bleeding. The other extreme example of that is look at the uh, bus or the what is called the transport industry, the passenger transport industry on the, on the road lines. They're also going full. They're also completely occupied and they're all making money. But What's happening within the airline industry? It's just not airline industry, but you'll keep coming. The more you think about it, that so many industries have just killed each other in the process. So what is happening? Despite the fact that all airlines are running 80% full, not, not now, but of course, two, three years back and soon again, they're not making money is because the rivalry within the industry is so strong that they don't have competition of new entrants because their new entrant is virtually impossible. Customers have no bargaining powers. Uh, I don't think we are in a situation of substitutes or the power of supplier is involved, but the industry is crumpling under its own internal fight. So Porter's five forces or Michael Porter defined five forces that can happen within a sector which could spell doom for any sector or for any industry or for any company within those sectors. So uh, that's one explanation which takes care of all of these slides. Uh, are you guys uh, following with me? Do I do I make sense? And uh, if yes, we will then move to the last on the subject. Uh, needless to say, you will, get, you will get a few questions on this as well. So make sure that you've understood. We are open for any discussions. All right, I have some, some examples here. Uh, you can read those examples. How, uh, McDonald's is able to uh, manage all these kinds of things and how they are able to bulldoze their suppliers. All of that is something that you will read about it. Okay. Geo also makes a significant presence here. Some, some more reading material for you. I'm almost done. We have another 10 minutes or 15 minutes of uh, time on this, and then we can call it a, uh, I have one other subject that I need to talk about. New share. Okay, the last on the subject, are you, are you seeing this slide? I guess you're seeing it, right? Can't hear, uh, Ruth, can't hear, am, am I audible? Uh, no, no, so now it's fine. Sorry. Now it's fine, now it's fine, okay, okay. Okay, what's all that is good. Finally, one small subject, you have a complete topic on market research which somebody else is going to take for you in further terms. This is just a, a bird's eye view on the subject. What is market research? Anybody, can you define what is market research and see what it does? No? Market research is probably checking the pulse of the, the consumer before launching a product. Before launching a product. Okay. So how would you do that? 
we can utilize the services like you know all this indian market research uh, uh, bureau or uh, volunteers with questionnaires uh, no no that's that's anant that's 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 uh, zoom coming down from uh, 30000 feet down to 10000 feet uh, so so no so what 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 is your what is it that you're trying to do? very good your your opening remarks were very nice uh, so what are you trying to understand um, by a market research you said you're going to feel the pulse of the customer yeah. is he is he going to be there do you think am i am i acceptable am i acceptable on what other parameters would you want to do am i acceptable on price am i acceptable on performance yes go ahead go ahead uh, professor ravi here hmm. actually market research means we'll understand the need of the customers and uh, what is the uh, what gap we have uh, to uh, launch our product for example i'm working in tvs motor company any new product development uh, we are doing the market right. research so we will we will visit individual customer different different customer what is his need what exactly want what is expectation what presently is using and whether it is satisfied or not or what is his expectation so all is uh, uh, inputs we are taking and that we are converting into technical uh, terms so, so then we are planning for the how do you get these inputs how do you get these inputs by doing surveys sir we asking are specific questions and Bye. asking specific question exactly mm -hmm. so so good 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 i'm 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 again trying to get most answers from you so that our conversation happens faster incidentally uh, uh you so ravi you said you're with tvs right yes sir yes professor okay, okay. so uh i i'll 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 quote a particular instance in which uh, tvs was a, one of the first guys to react very quickly on a on a on a market uh, on a market reaction not on a market research okay uh, this this conversation goes back to the early uh, late 80s and early 90s uh, when tvs had a scooter called the tvs champ champ yes okay now the the tvs champ had a had a it was a very very popular and a very uh, uh, well well uh, liked the product but it had a it had a very small drawback the problem was that um, the silencer was slightly protruding the sli silencer was slightly protruding and what would happen is on a long journey accidentally uh, more for the women and less for the men because of the the way that they keep their leg uh, the silencer would burn their the, their feet or or the ankle area and so so i remember uh, this kind of a conversation that went on within tvs i i i i'll hold it for myself as to how i know this information so was that they actually were able to quickly look at this complaint which came from their service centers so when women went to the service center for the thing they would complain saying that uh, your silencers get heated up and it would cause problem with our to our sarees they would have sarees being burnt at the edge and what they reacted was they reacted so very quickly that they put up some kind of a guard i don't know how it works or which has an air gap in between and some kind of a perforated guard on the sari side. guard uh, we are calling as a sari no no we are not talking about the sari guard the sari guard is a universal thing the sari guard is to it this it, it pulls away the, the wheel pulls away the sari i'm not talking about that i'm talking about the guard on the silencer yeah it's a flap they have used yes yeah they use the flap that that they were the first companies to introduce this based on market inputs from their service section very rare does a company pay attention to service complaints as a source of market research uh, i hope you're trying to understand the 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 brilliant nuances that that company had at that time to take this input and come up with the, this which probably resulted in champ being a very very popular model so good now that you you said that i 
I wanted to recalling uh, knowledge. Yes. 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 So, so this is what market research is all about. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get too much of detail into it, except that market research gives information which reduces uncertainty. Market research tells you whether you should be entering the market or should you not be entering into the market. Uh, they, they're just going to be two points of conversation here and that we will have, which is, uh, uh, one is, well, let me get back to the thing. Why is market research required? This is something for you to go and do this. Market research helps you strategize the market. Finally, there are, I'm, I'm, I'm just jumping down to two particular slides and then want to do this because, yes. There are, and I want you to understand this. We'll, uh, we'll talk briefly about primary research and secondary research and then consider the chapter as kind of closed. Okay, so what is primary research? Is primary research is when you physically go and obtain that data. You go, you put your people on the field, you, you find out what is their feel about it. You, you ask people um, uh, a lot of questions about the product and then uh, you come to a conclusion on whether the product is going to be accepted. It could be product in terms of taste, if it's a particular thing or if it's a particular service that's going to be done, we do it all the time. But the catch that you have with primary research is that normally you do not mention the name of the company which would be doing which be introducing this product because uh, then the reaction becomes very biased in terms of it. Secondary research is research that you gather from non-direct sourcing of information. That is by reading articles, by, by listening to, uh, to information that is available in, in various industry forums, and whether how which way the direction of the market is going forward. So I, I just want to live it with these two things. Uh, there are um, there are more on market research. As always, every subject has uh, um, every subject has its own plus and minus points of it. There are few slides about how some some companies did well and some companies uh, did very badly even on the market research, one of the most famous stories that always come up is that if you don't do a market research, you could be in big trouble. That was when Coke, as in Coca-Cola, felt that it was so strong that it could even decide what is the best taste that, should, that a Coke should have that they came up with a new flavor called the new Coke, or that it became just the, uh, the, the new flavor of the Coke. And the whole reaction of that was that it was very badly taken by the customer. But the market research, however, showed that people were willing to accept this new taste, the new taste of Coke. And the market research showed that brilliant, the world is willing to accept a new taste on the Coke. But remember, they never mentioned during the market research that this is Coca-Cola who's coming out with the new taste. Now, there is uh, in, in, in American consumerism, there is no endless conversation about how they have love for their product. So when Coke changed the flavor, there was huge reaction to it. There was strong reaction. They were, they just refused to, they refused to uh, even accept it. And uh, they were finally, they had to revert back to the classic Coke. So sometimes market research also can be very badly hit. There are other examples about uh, Colgate, Colgate wanting to enter into foods company and never got along well. I mean, how would, how would you like to have a, a Colgate 
uh, pasta or something like that. It was bad research, didn't really do that. But there is supposed to be that Kodak did try to enter into the uh, digital camera market, but the market survey indicated that uh, there was no really no point in doing it. So sometimes it could also give you wrong results. And that's, that's Diet Coke per se as such. Okay. Then, uh, then that's all I'm, I'm done for. I'm, I'm completely done with my, my subject at 4.03. Uh, we, can have a, uh, we can have a round of conversation. I, I work with you, Euro Monitor, International Market Research Company that provides strategy and tips research. That's brilliant, very nice to know that. We are conducting primary and secondary market <laughs> research. That's nice. So anybody wants to get in touch with Parvati can do that. Okay, good. So well, I am sorry, I was. <laughs> oh, you I, were. I uh, was. Yeah. For, uh, yeah, my, yeah. I'm sorry. My my reading was bad. My reading. Bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I yeah. was part of Euro Monitor. I was heading the HR and Operations Division. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So good. So nice. There you see. That's exactly why I believe that uh, Executive Marketing MBA is a brilliant forum. Is because term after term, it's been learning on both sides. Learning for me as much as it has been learning for you all. So it's now almost time to say goodbye. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed my classes. I hope it was interesting. And uh, I, I love teaching you all. Mm, I, I hope uh, you guys were quite occupied in the classes. Yes. You you now open to any questions that you want to ask about all the 18 hours we've been together. It could be on any subject that you may have a doubt or you can just have another five, 10 minutes of lighthearted discussion before we call it a day. Yes. I have a question. Uh, just wanted to ask uh, what could be our approach for preparing for our examinations, like whether we should go for PPT only the way you have presented or we should combine PPT with some book or the courseware that we have. Okay, uh, generally, um, uh, generally PPT should be fine. Uh, but if the PPT has helped you to get an idea of the subject, then it's more than enough. I wouldn't, uh, of course, there is uh, Philip Kotler's book that I would want you to read. Mm, that will be that will be one way to look at it. But uh, you read uh, actually, as you can see, market research has got some 50, 50 slides, and I I I barely took eight minutes to jump jump through it left, right, and center. Uh, so if, if you want, you can read through all those eighty slides, uh, or you you follow my subject, you'll do well. Or if I have taught you well, you'll do well. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, Abbas, is that answer satisfying? Yes, it is. No? Yeah, okay. So answer is, yeah, read, read. The more you read, the more is better. It's, going, it's not going to be completely syllabus-based. It's going to be a little, always a little out of syllabus. There's going to be, um, there's going to be case study, which I, you would want to understand, but you guys have done well in case studies. You've, you've, you've done through the best of the Harvard case studies. What more can I ask for? Hmm. Okay. Anybody else? That's it. So thank you. And uh, all the very best. Hopefully, when you're in turn two or three and the world is back to normal, we will, uh, we will meet. Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, that bargaining to customers thing. Uh, actually, the example what uh, we discussed was okay, but uh, uh, thinking from a dis different perspective, generally customers are the ones, like say, if you see the market uh, product wise, uh, or is the service wise, generally, if you see cu customers are actually on the receiving end. So hmm. you can't actually uh, think of... Uh, the power of it in 
most of it. So I was just trying to understand how okay. to... Deepika, Deepika, I'll give you another example. I'll give you an example. Are you, are you in Bangalore? Of course you are, right? Most okay. Time. And are you, are you been, are you, have you been in Bangalore for a long time? Yes, sir. More than 10 okay. years. More than 10 years now. Good. Now, there's a store and they're all over the place. There's a store called Gramina. I don't know if you know it. Or, or there are stores like Gramin. They sell you, uh, uh, what is it called? Organic products. Organic products, organic uh, tomatoes, organic biscuits, organic oats, organic chakli, organic biscuits, all of that. Have you been to a store like that, Deepika? Um, I, I know organic products and all, not Gramin, sir. I've been to okay, like Gramin, like Gramin. You see, there are hundreds of products, hundreds of products. Every day as a new supplier coming in and trying to sell his products. Now, remember, these are organic, which means that you cannot sell them in food world. You cannot sell them in big bazaar. You cannot sell them in this one because there you are competing, first of all, for eye space. Visa is a non-organic product. It's become, it's ultra sugary Britannia biscuits versus jaggery based biscuits. So there you are a different competitor. You will not get a market share. I go all the way to this store like Grameen or another organic store because I want original non-pesticide stuff. And there are hundreds of suppliers out there, hundreds of suppliers. Every time you go, you get a new brand. Now, how does he get one is shelf space there? How does he, how, how do I, he catch my eye that these stores are all very small and these stores have become a brand by themselves because if I want to buy organic food, or organic thing, I go to this store called the organic store. So there, they are the customers for the suppliers. They are the customers for the suppliers. These guys who come and sell these organic products, they have to virtually beg to be, to be on the store. And then what do you think he's going to say? He's going to say your MRP is 80 rupees for a box of biscuits. I'm going to keep 50% of it till, and the other 50 I give you. Now, this guy has to agree to that till he becomes a brand by himself, till he becomes a brand by himself. Now, there are certain brands of organic stuff which have now become very popular. So now I go to the store and ask the store, do you have this particular brand of the organic stuff? Now, it is not the bargaining power of the customer. Now it has become the bargaining power of the supplier because now if that particular brand of organic food is not there, I won't go to that shop. But to get there, it is the shopkeeper who's always at a better position of bargaining to from than the supplier. I hope I'm able to right, sir. get this so, explained. Yeah, this is uh, very much thought provoking and <laughs> in a different way. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Right, right, right. So it happens. That's why it's very, very difficult. I will give you, lastly, I'll give you one example on the bargaining power of the customer. See, for all my donkey's years, I've, I've worked with the, the, the largest satellite manufacturer in the world, the largest satellite operator in the world, the largest satellite service provider in the world. And then I and my boss, all the time, we said we must do something on our own. And we started off this company, which logo now you guys know very well. Now, we thought we are the best in the industry. Of course, we were the best in the industry because we worked with the best in the industry, we worked for the best in the industry. Now, when I start off on my, on my own, I go to, my, go to a potential customer. The customer doesn't want to buy my product because he says, hey, Ramesh, uh, all that is fine. You and I were good friends when you were working for that company. Now he wants to bargain. 
there was a time when when i would decide who would be my customer because i worked for the largest satcom company i would they would have to make sure that i they get an opportunity right now because i am nobody in the business my customer has the huge bargaining power so that happens all the time till the brand is established then it becomes quite big so i hope i was able to tell that i don't know why i mentioned this okay okay yes okay good anybody else any other question or all or you all know what's a brand what's a vision what's a mission i had one particular slide i i'll tell you what what is i'll leak out the question paper for you guys in the next 10 minutes i'll ask you what's a vision i'll ask you what's marketing i'll ask you what's stp i'll ask you what is bcg i'll ask you to explain the seven buying centers in in business i'll ask you what's the difference between b2b to b2c and we'll say what are the three ways in which a purchase can be made in then we will ask you what are the ways in which competition fights with each other then what is the role of a gatekeeper what is the role of an influencer then what is uh, predatory pricing what is uh, freemium pricing what is the willingness to buy uh, what is gross margin effect on bulk purchase all that are the possible questions that might come up okay good thank you very much uh, good day to all of you and uh, hopefully i'll see you all in, in the subsequent years thank you thank professor you, okay thank you professor thank you thank professor thank you professor thank you professor thank you for your time thank you good thank you professor thank you professor thank you professor thank you professor thank you very much thank you professor